I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the data uh, in, referred to in the title and also some of the better practices. But I have a Miriam who knows the data but is really grounded in practice as well to keep me honest and make sure we don't forget that practice I'm a part. Bit of a side kick yeah, this, we're going to go back and forth <laughs> freely here. So um, one thing I have to say is, even though it's pretty nerdy, is that all this nerdy stuff it re reflects my views and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis or the Federal Reserve System. But let's get right into it. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, things that came out of the Native Homeownership Coalition, data that show both challenges and effective practices regarding land on the HUD-184 and mortgages in general and trust land, things that came out that were used the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data and some other data sources. We're going to see room for improvement regarding all of these. Um, and in particular, we'll see room for tribes to be part of that process of making things better and of using the data that we have, even as we are improving it. One theme that we talked about yesterday, some of you have seen this before, is that trust land is, on the one hand, very important to Indian country. On the other hand, we don't measure it all that well. So I showed this yesterday, too. Um, there's various sources at the census give me around 70 to 75 million total acres on federally recognized reservations. Recent American Community Survey says 73 million, but that's a hard number even the total acreage to pin down. Uh, when you get to try to get official figures on trust land, either in total or tribal or individual trust land on reservations, we don't have uh, a really clear authoritative source. Uh, the BIA is beginning to share some new data on that, and I think improvements are coming, but we still lack a fully authoritative, conveniently available source of information about even total trust land or trust land in total by reservation, let alone, you know, we're not talking about individual parcels. Yeah, here. so before you go on from there, Dick, I think one of the things that I want to just uh, twist us looking at this in a slightly different way as well. So while we'd, we definitely know we need better data on um, the, the, the land areas, one thing to just look at with this map is, this is one of those, you can see it from space kind of uh, uh, impressions of, this is a lot of land. Trust land is a lot of land. And if we think of that as an area where there's an underdeveloped homeownership housing supply, that is a lot of area to exclude, and we want to include it. And so for me, part of this is looking at this as, you know, what is that total land base? Yeah, we'd like to know better numbers on the specific details of the amount, but let's not ignore it as a land base on which home ownership can be developed. And just visually, this reminds us that there's a lot of scope for change. Yeah, the green areas here are where, you know, very high percentage, estimated at least, very high percentage of trust land. The blue, which are still pretty big, there's at least a moderate percentage of trust land there, too. So we had, I think Steve mentioned this morning, like 16,000 Home Mortgage Disclosure Act loans to American Indians in recent years, but only 300, 350 on trust land. This is a huge resource base that is not being used very intensively for home ownership. We need to change that. That's Miriam's point, I think. Um, and, you know, tribes, we, we talk a lot about the BIA's role. They do have a role. It's important that they meet it. They're, they're making some progress, and that's very good. Uh, but we also know that the tribes uh, can pitch in and do things for themselves. The National Tribal Land Staff Association does a lot in this area. There's a tribal geographic information support group. Indigenous mapping workshop is coming on an international basis in Montreal. We had an article even in our own community development a few years ago about GIS technology helping tribes. So the tribal work on land data is important, too. I want to move along, though, and talk about um, something we've seen in the HUD-184 mortgage data uh, that was shared to us, with us by HUD. Um, we see, on the one hand, um, this well-known fact that the use of 184s, excuse me, on uh, Fee land really took off after that was opened up for off-reservation lending in 2005, whereas the black line here, which is the use on uh, tribal trust, or the yellow line, which is individual trust, the use of 184s on those trust lands has stayed very flat and low at the same time as the fee land uses. It just exploded so that now 90% of the 184s are on fee land, not trust. 
Yeah, and I, th I think that's a really important figure to, to focus on. So if you, we looked at this, this is annual data, but if you looked at it in its cumulative form, it looks even worse. And that's where you really see that the 90% of 184 loans since inception have been on fee land. And that's even counting that period where a lot of them were still on um, trust land as well in, in proportional amounts. I want to, again, turn this and look at it in a slightly different way than we've just been talking about. I think. What we see from that fee land line is something that's really important to take away, is that um, tribal citizens, tribal members are well able, many of them, to um, participate in the mortgage market. So that means they're, they've got credit worthiness, they've got an ability to repay, they've got um, a participation ability. And um, so when you sometimes hear that argument out there that says, oh, tri tribal citizens or tribal members are not, they don't have that capacity to participate. The fee experience shows that they do. So what this really points to is the need, again, to open it up on tribal trust land as well. Right. And, uh, you know, as we discussed yesterday, and this slide was seen by some of you, that is happening in some places. It's not impossible. It's being done. Mm -hmm. So this slide, this slide shows, it's a little more complicated. This is showing the total number of 184, uh, HUD-184 loans uh, made by tribal area up to 400 here. We're actually, uh, Osage kind of goes off the chart over here, so I apologize to Osage, they're not on this graph. That's the volume. This is showing you how much of the volume, what percentage of the volume is on trust land. So what we'd kind of like to see is something way up here where you're doing a lot of it and a lot of it on trust land. And we sort of see it right there. Jason, Flathead, Bob, Flathead. We're seeing good volume and a high percentage, over 75% of that 184 there on trust land. We're seeing it in a cluster of places in Wisconsin, Tanya, Bay Bank, and Chippewa Valley Bank in years past. We're seeing it at Oneida, Lac de Flambeau, La, La Couture, Red Cliff. We've seen it historically in Morongo. We've seen it in Isabella. I don't know if Kevin's here today. Uh, we, we don't know, Miriam, Miriam and I don't know as much about uh, Lummi and Tulalip but we're seeing it there too. Yes. We have more to learn. The, um, and we've heard this point over and over, but I don't think we can stress it enough. From a policy and practice standpoint, yes, every single tribe is different, but there's a ton to be learned from these nations that are doing well. So take these opportunities to speak to the people who are here. Um, the Center for Indian Country Development has a case study of Oneida coming up to better understand that, and that'll be out there um, sort of broadly. But one of the things we hear, hear over and over in the work that we do at Native Nations Institute, and I think those of you like Jackie um, can attest to this as well, that telling stories of success in Indian country, sharing those stories of success so that it's not necessarily replicating it at another tribe, but finding those pieces that your nation can pick up on and do and be inspired by. Pick out those ones that are in that northeast corner there and, and follow what, what kinds of policies and practices that they're doing to get those good home ownership rates on tribal trust land. So now this chart we didn't show yesterday. It's a little more complicated in some ways. I have, and the labels are hard to read, so let me explain. What we have here, this is from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, and I'm going to break it out into all borrow, the, first of all, the territory. This is all about census tracts that overlap a reservation. They at least touch a reservation. Some of them just barely touch a reservation. Some of them are 100% on a reservation. So it's all census tracts that at least touch a federally recognized reservation. That's the area. In those census tracts, I'm going to look at all borrowers, which is going to be predominantly non-Hispanic white, and I'm going to look at American Indian borrowers. And on this graph, I'm showing uh, the uh, percent of either loans or loan applications that are for manufactured home loans. What you see for the total population is a fairly moderate usage. Uh, a lot of reservations are rural, and manufactured homes are fairly common in rural. So you're seeing about 14% uh, about of all borrowers on reservations or in these census tracts are requesting a manufactured home loan. And about 10% of them, of the loans that are made, are on manufactured housing. So that's kind of the baseline for all borrowers on these reservation census tracts. When we shift to the American Indian borrowers, we see a much more uh, higher usage. We're seeing Almost two thirds, well, over like five eighths, over 60% of the applications for home loans are for manufactured home loans. And about 40% of the actual loans 
are for manufactured home loans. Now, I don't want to say that's a bad thing. It's, it can be taken various ways. We have some friends in the room here from Prosperity Now and from Rural Lisk who have worked with us to make the case that you know, much of this is very appropriate and a good thing in some ways because we know there's an affordability problem. We know manufactured housing has changed a lot over the years and is much higher quality today, and it can be a very affordable solution if it's done right. But there's some issues with manufactured housing as well, and we want to talk about those. So I'm not here to, I'm here to tell you to think anew about manufactured housing, both good and bad, be, but partly because it is important, and we're going to discuss that. It's a big deal in Indian country. Now, one other thing about this that I want to note is that the difference between the loans made and the requests for loans is rather large here for the American Indian borrowers. Let me skip ahead a couple slides, and I'm going to talk about denial rates on loans. So this is denial rates mean of all the applications made, and I'm going to take applications which either result in a loan, a refusal of the loan by the lender, or a refusal of a loan by the borrower. That is, the lender said OK, and the borrower walked away. Mm -hmm. So that's what my base is. Of those types of applications, we see for stick-built or site-built homes, we see that um, denial rates are somewhere in the 15 to 30 percent range in these um, census tracts overlapping reservations. That's for all races. But at the top, in the black line, are American Indian borrowers. So they're getting denied at around a 25% around a rate on average, higher than uh, on average than all the other groups, racial groups shown here. Um, and that's for the stick-built homes. But when we shift to manufactured homes, everyone moves up, but the American Indian denial rates, again, are at the top and are you know, in the 55 up to 70% range in recent years of denial rates on those loans. So this is something, again, that we should be paying attention to. I want to shift back a little bit more on, on manufactured homes and bring in an, its connection with trust land. So this is a complicated one. I'll have to work on this a little. But what we have, oop, I'll have to work on learning how to use the clicker, too. But over here, what we have here are home loan applications by American Indian borrowers, again, on these census tracts around reservations. This time, I'll explain a little slicing and dicing of those census tracts, too. On this side, we have home loan applications by others, non-American Indians, also in the same reservation touching census tracts. But it's not just all the census tracts that touch a reservation in one big lump now. I've broken them out into four groups. This group on the left barely touches a reservation. 10% or less of the housing units in these tracts are t within the reservation. Same over here. On the left side, less than 10% of the housing units in the tract are on the reservation. On the right side, at least 90% of the housing units are on the reservation. Same over here. For American Indians, for others. Low, not, barely touching the reservation, almost completely on the reservation. Barely, almost completely. What you see for other borrowers, when you shift from barely touching the reservation, where there's hardly any trust land, into the middle of the reservation, where there's lots of trust land, you see no change almost in the use of manufactured home loans because other borrowers have no real involvement with trust land. For American Indian borrowers, when you shift from very little trust land to lots of trust land in the middle of the reservation, you see a couple things. First of all, you see at the base level, even where there's very little trust land, the usage of manufactured homes is higher already. This bar is higher than that bar. So there is some base level difference, even, off, even at the edge of the reservation or off the reservation, where American Indians use manufactured homes loans somewhat more, perhaps because of income issues, other things. But what really stands out is as you move from the edge of the reservation where there's little trust land into the middle where there's lots of trust land, the use of manufactured home loans by American Indians but not others really shoots up. Uh, and that, I think, reflects again, this is another way of coming back to that point that trust land is different for home ownership, and we do need to look at that. 
I'm not, I'm not here to, as I said, I have a very open mind about manufactured housing. I'm not here to slam manufactured housing. But the fact that manufactured housing is used so much more here than here suggests to me that something is going on with trust land that is influencing this choice, and we don't want that extra influence. We want people to choose manufactured homes for whatever reason makes sense to them, not because trust land is making it so difficult to do stick build. Just to add on to that, I think that, you know, kind of to put it in a slightly different terms, that um, remember the name of this convenience about creating the opportunity for choice, and there is some signal here that the choice for site built homes is just lower um, on uh, uh, trust lands, which we know, but these data help begin to signal to back that up, and that there are, um, there's less supply there than there should be. So if in the spirit of creating the opportunity for choice, the choice shouldn't just be manufactured home or a rental home, it should also be a site built home. And these data begin to push in that direction, that that opportunity for choice of that wide range of choice just isn't there. Um, Dick, I don't know, can we go back to the, can we go forward, I guess, to the next slide? Uh, no, not if oh, I do that, no, okay, not. there we go. Yes, this one. Uh, I also want to just um, point out another sort of oblique thing to look at this. Uh, Dick and others have done some other work on um, credit scores, but I think there's another thing that we're starting to see here is just looking at that difference of the denial rates uh, uh, on the manufactured homes and even on the site-built homes, you'll see that those denial rates are higher for American Indians and Alaska Natives. And um, another policy and practice that we've talked about today that we again want to underscore is just how important it is to do credit counseling, to do home ownership um, uh, training, uh, to do credit repair work, to try to do something to increase the credit worthiness of, um, of potential borrowers because we do see these disjunctions. Um, and again, I point you to other work that Dick has done uh, on looking directly at credit files and we see similar results, which just again underscores the importance of that work of um, working directly on um, potential borrowers' credit scores. Thanks. I'm going to move on to talk a little bit, one final slide about manufactured homes, because the lending side of that market is interesting also. And I think it requires attention. Clayton Homes is a major manufacturer of manufactured housing. They own uh, multiple lenders who finance those homes. There's nothing inherently bad about that, but they do own two that are very, very large in Indian country, 21st Mortgage and Vanderbilt. This purple area shows, uh, this box here shows the share, market share of 21st mortgage. This big box here shows the market share in Indian country to American Indian borrowers of Vanderbilt mortgage, both owned by the same company. Their share of applications and loans made on manufacturing houses is very high. It's 70, 80 percent on, it's like close to 80, 70, 80 percent on applications and 60 or 70 percent on loans made. So that's a very high market share. We're very dependent on these two lenders owned by one company. So, you know, that doesn't mean things are automatically bad, but it does mean we should be paying attention because we're being served by a very narrow range of lenders in this, run, in this market. It, it creates scope for um, poor behavior on behalf of lenders. That doesn't mean it's happening right now, but it could. Um, and just from a practice and policy standpoint, it also suggests that there are things that tribes should be doing to protect themselves against possible predation, predation like p passing laws that limit interest rates and things like that. So um, again, this isn't saying anything that we, is anything bad happening right now, but it does point to the potential for bad things and shows that there's room for tribal policy and practice to enter on the side of um, uh, protecting tribal citizens. Yeah, it may be that you know, tribal uh, housing uh, leaders can pay attention to who their lenders are locally, get to know them, get to know who they are, get to know the dealers, get to understand, and, and pay attention to your consumers. What are they saying? Are they having good experiences or not? Know, know what's going on in this market. So we're gonna to turn to one last source of data from the census, which is their on the map tool. Uh, and we're gonna thank Jewel and Patrice and others for bringing this topic up yesterday. Uh, this is a handy tool that's online, and sometimes I think, uh, uh, I'll give Preston, I think it's uh, Braveheart, I believe, out at Umatilla who helped put me onto this. It's a very handy tool. Uh, you can look here and find a lot of information about commuting patterns. So what we're showing, this is Crow Reservation as an example that we've written up in a um, little blog on our website. You can find out 
How many people here in this inner circle live on the reservation and work on the reservation? It turns out there's 607 workers in this Crow 2014 data who lived on the reservation and worked on the reservation. There's an additional 1,600 workers who lived on the reservation and worked outside the reservation. Actually, you know, two to three times as many living on the reservation and working off. There's 1,300 who lived off and worked on the reservation. Twice as many people coming in than lived there. And it turns out you can dig into these data. A lot of these people you can show in the data are American Indian. There's a lot of American Indian workers driving onto the reservation to work. That's what Jewel talked about yesterday, 66 miles, whatever, to get to a job, et cetera. And Patrice talked about turning down a job on Standing Rock because she couldn't get housing there. There's a lot of American Indians driving into Crow every day to work. And you can look this up and find this kind of information about your reservation. Not every reservation looks like this. They're not all like this. And the data do change from year to year. But it's, it's something you can monitor to figure out what the flows are and see what the housing demand might be in your area. Yeah, and I think it really speaks to um, the ways that people are thinking about um, living and working on, in tribal communities on reservations. Uh, clearly, at a place like Crow, there's a real opportunity for them to increase supply of on-reservation, potentially home ownership kinds of housing with all those people commuting on. Um, but it also shows that they're doing a pretty good job of providing housing for people who want to be part of the community yep. um, and yet have work off. I think it points to the, uh, just in terms of practice, of really knowing the population uh, in your community and keeping track of it in a more granular way. There were several folks yesterday, particularly in the final panel, who talked about the need for a more granular understanding of who's living in what housing, why they're living there, what that kind of housing is that's serving them. Is it elder housing? Is it transitional housing? Is it housing for families that are younger who then may want to move on to larger housing? So keeping track of that kind of demographics of your population, this is another piece of the demographics crossed with housing to think about while developing a broader housing policy. And that's that notion of what are the employment demographics of the housing as well. So just if you're interested in this, I'll just briefly note, uh, here's a link to where we explain how to use it for Indian country. And these slides will be available so you can come back to this link readily. Um, Miriam, we're only down to about five minutes now. And I think I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about the handout you all have. There should be a yellow sheet of paper probably on your table. And uh, we're going to exchange roles here. I get to be the sidekick now. <laughs> So the theme of today really is that more, better, faster theme. And uh, it was really applied to getting people into housing and getting, pe and getting home ownership going. But there's a version of that apl that applies to data, too, that we need more, better, faster data to really make comments in a variety of ways. One is to learn things that we didn't know about mortgage markets and home ownership in Indian country, to really help us ask better questions, um, to make arguments to policymakers and to others who we really need to draw into the work, and also to you know, develop better better practice and policy, which is kind of the point of this session. So this handout on the gold sheet of paper just provides um, three major ideas uh, about areas in which there's room for improvement, some of which we've already talked about. And I have no idea how to use this pointer. OK, all right. The big, the big green one. <laughs> OK, I got that now. Um, so first off, uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, and Dick has covered it, about we need there's room for improvement in the land data. We spent a tremendous amount of time yesterday talking about that. Uh, and I do want to just underscore the fact that this is work that's going on in a number of tribal communities. And we heard some ideas about how to work on this yesterday. Chris Stainbrook said that his organization, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, is helping tribes do this. Um, there's opportunities uh, through uh, independent um, outfits to do that as well. And there's a lot of capacity within tribal communities. So we need a lot of work um, to, to press on that front uh, and to continue to work on the land data. Uh, under, on your gold worksheet, we've really fleshed out the that's a problem piece and the why. One of the reasons we fleshed this out is that in order to make this argument to the folks who are able to help tribes get better, better data is sometimes you really need to put the words out there. So here's the set of arguments. It's a problem for households and businesses because it affects economic development overall. It's a problem for exercising tribal sovereignty and doing that in a more complete um, fashion to really uh, take advantage of, of self-government. It's a problem for research, and it's a problem for policymakers. So again, we've tried to list some of the arguments about why. Just to move on, though, um, here it is. 
There's room for improvement on the home loan data as well. We've got some really concrete ideas that we'd like folks to work on and follow up on. One is to work with federal agencies in every way that you can to advocate, to respond to opportunities for comment, to encourage um, uh, the, uh, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act reporting to include HUD 184 loans. There's already information about um, some of the other kinds of subsidized loan categories on there, but this is the most complete data set that we have for understanding mortgage lending um, anywhere and understanding mortgage lending in Indian country. That fine-grained, better information that we got about manufactured housing came from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, but we're really unable to use it to understand other kinds of lending in Indian country because it's not broken out. Oftentimes it's not broken out or even not reported. Another category that's not frequently reported into the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data set is from small community lenders who aren't necessarily required to report in because they're not doing the volume of lending, and that includes CDFIs. So really expanding that data set to be as um, uh, representative as it needs to be for us to understand the um, mortgage situation in Indian country is really important. So advocating to do that, and um, if you're a reporter, um, voluntarily reporting into that system, even if you're not required to. Uh, we also encourage that there be more collaboration with native CDFIs and other community lenders to really understand what their lending picture looks like. Some native CDFIs have really done this work, and it's um, been quite informative about what the lending picture looks like on their reservation. Uh, and we have other suggestions on, on the handout. Uh, and I've really already covered point three as well. But one of the points that came up that in the small group that I was in that I just wanted to highlight, it's another piece of data. We've talked about the land date and how important it is to know the meets and the bounds and what the lease information is and the TLSR, that kind of work. It's also really important to have a very complete picture of what the housing is on, on a reservation. Some communities have actually mapped, and, and I can't remember who mentioned this yesterday, but every structure on the reservation, every permanent dwelling to understand and what the status of that was. Where did it come from? Was it built by HUD? Is it still a, a house under control of the TDHE? Is it a rent to own house? Is, is it a site built home that is under home ownership? And knowing what that market really looks like and understanding that is another piece of home ownership data that is important that will help these markets function better. Finally, I just want to call attention to something that we don't think very much about unless you're a researcher, but I think that it's something that we need to do everybody in the room and encourage others to do more is data monitoring, is to make sure that this data is regularly produced, updated, and analyzed. And we have a number of suggestions about how to do that. And we're actually piggybacking on other institutions that have done this work too. So the recent HUD and Urban Institute report about housing in Indian country has a number of um, valuable recommendations about how to really get involved with and track and engage data. And we've given you the website to go there and learn more about that. Um, we. Uh, encourage that tribal leadership and native organizations on the housing front also be engaged in data monitoring locally and with these national data sets to make sure that tribal information, American Indian information, isn't sort of the asterisk not included information to make sure that it's there. Um, and uh, I also just want to call out the CICD for the work that they've done on the reservation profiles. They've included a lot of information about uh, native communities and tribes on those reservation profiles. But, and so they serve a data monitoring function, but they can do even more as you reach out and tell them the kinds of data that they can be putting up there and providing and helping do that monitoring function. And in this example, I didn't realize that that was where the on the map suggestion had come from. It came from the public, right? It came from a tribal uh, user who said, this is the kind of data monitoring that you can help with, and CICD was able to come in and fill that breach, so that was fabulous. Uh, and so you can see that in number three of using that the on the map um, uh, work, and again, referring you to exactly how to use it is there. Um, and finally, I'm just going to tell you something that seems obvious, and I know a number of you do it, um, but just to continue to encourage you to do it is to monitor, monitor credit scores in your communities um, and to really help those whose scores can rise um, with the credit counseling and home ownership and also be advocating for those with high enough scores to be engaged in the home ownership market. Um, so those are just some ideas to really keep that data flowing in a more, better, faster way so that we can learn more about um, good policy and practice in mortgage lending and home ownership in Indian country, um, prove, uh, proof of concept that it works, and to advocate um, for good policy and practice. So thanks. All right. <clears throat> Arlen King is Midwest Minnesota. I wonder, have you looked at the impact of below market rents that a lot of tribal 
housing authorities provide and kind of its deleterious effect on home ownership? Yeah, Jewel mentioned that today too. Am I on here? No, you've got to switch it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Jewel mentioned that. We talked about the rent caps, I think. I have not done that yet, Arlen. It's been on my mind. It's something I would like to know more about and learn more about. As Jewel mentioned, I think it's an important issue as well as a delicate issue uh, because you're dealing with how you, you know, assist at some level. Some of the people there are being uh, rightfully assisted with affordability issues, but as Jewel noted, it's probably not the most targeted way to do that, and it may have some bad side effects in terms of keeping middle-income people, discouraging middle-income people from owning. And I think it's an important question. I agree with Jewel that it's probably a delicate question, but I think it's also a very important question. So I'm just going to say that I think that some of those data may be, might be very hard to get a hold of because those are um, uh, private to the TDHE on what the rents are. And to really do an assessment, you're going to need to know what the income is of the folks living in the homes as well and what the size of the family is. So that's pretty detailed information that might be um, hard to access. That said, I do think one of the first things that we need to do on this front is to make a good, strong, clear, um, understandable economic argument about why this is a bad thing and get that out there as a piece of um, information to share with tribal leadership, with TDHE directors, with tribal citizens, so that that conversation is had in a safer way. Um, to make that point that says it might feel like you're doing a family a good turn by allowing them to pay a lower rent, but ultimately you're pulling down the overall economic development on the reservation by doing that time after time. And so to make that in a generic fashion first and to really get the conversation going and then see if there might be a nation or two that would be, or many more that would be able to participate in a larger analysis would be valuable. Actually, you reminded me, Miriam, I have done what Arlen asked. We have, it is on our reservation profiles that Miriam mentioned, in a sense, from the American Community Survey. Mm -hmm. The American Community Survey has a measure of which households are cost burdened, and they break that out by income. And I'll, I'll, that chart looks like this. For uh, non-Indians, you see a high burden for poor people, and it goes down gradually as income rises. So as income's increasing, percentage of the households that are cost burdening goes down. For American Indians on reservations, you see the same thing at the low end. You see a high number, high percentage cost burdened when they're like below the poverty level. And then there's a cliff, and it goes way down right away, way down to a low level as soon as you're out of poverty. It doesn't go down gradually like it does for the normal population, not normal, the, the large population, the non-native population. It has this unusual shape of dropping off a cliff. And I think that reflects this phenomenon. So it is, you reminded me, it is in a certain sense in our reservation profiles. Bob was next. Bob and then. One more from Bob. All right. Yeah, I had a question. And by the way, I really like the information you're giving us yesterday and today, trust land and so forth. The data on 184 or lending, is there any way that you can tell? In, you have the number of on-reservation on and off-reservation mortgage loans. Can you tell me how many of those are made by a tribe or a housing authority as opposed to individual borrowers? Um, I think I might be able to. Uh, the, we do have data, I think in, in, in the final analysis, not quite. Uh, in, for the loans made on fee land for much of this historical period, we have Rachel Wellhausen in the audience from University of Texas who has a great micro data set on fee land 184s and could get down to that level of who's doing what on, one, on fee land. On trust land, the data we have from HUD are um, not that granular. We could know some of the leading borrowers. They've given us like a list of the top 25 in aggregate, but we couldn't break it out by you know, down to housing authorities and CDFIs at a local level. It's not there for the trust land part. Well, thank you. With, with regulations coming out any day, the first draft, it's, a, it's an important issue for us because we have a sense that a lot of tribes are using the program in a way that you might consider commercial. And it's kind of a mixed bag. We, we feel like if there's a need for capital for tribes, wherever they get, it's a good thing. But it's caused a program to explode, and it's caught the attention, I believe, of 
uh, examiners and others that with nobody expect this to be a six billion dollar uh, program housed at ONAP, which is a very small staff. And the more it becomes a com commercial in nature, where tribes are using it for employee housing and different things like that, and at some rates building it, charging rents and allowing non-Indians to live there as a revenue source, it, it, it's not a commercial product. It's a residential product with affordability and approval levels that are not consistent with commercial practices. That's been a concern of ours, and we haven't heard anybody address it yet. 